Hello and good morning uh, and welcome again to St Peter Mancroft for another one of our talks for Heritage Open Week. It's good to welcome you all here, those of you who are in church, and of course to welcome those who are watching on our live stream channel. Um, those in church, if you don't remember everything, um, I promise you there is no test at the end, but you might like, oh is that okay, um, well you might like to just check up again and have another look online so if you do um, the internet and stuff if you go on to the St Peter Mancroft website you'll find today's talk there as well as the talks that we've had previously this week and also if you wanted to catch up things that are on there from previous years as well I'm just looking at our communications guy and yep they're there as well so there's plenty to look at on the St Peter Mancroft website well, today's Wednesday, so it must be Jan King. Jan is one of our blue badge guides in the city and a great friend of mine um, from, uh, she's a guide in another large church in the, in the city. Today, we're going to be hearing um, about the market, Mancroft and Moore. So roughly, at, from the comfort of our seats or sitting at home with a coffee, we're gonna have a wander around Norwich with Jan and uh, she's going to tell us a lot more about the history of our city um, and the area around here. So without much ado, may I introduce to you Jan and could we welcome her in the traditional manner. Jan, thank you. Thank you very much. It's um, lovely to see so many people here. Um, I started guiding here hundreds of years ago, it seems, about 1066, I think, um, at least in the early 90s, and uh, I was in here every week. Uh, I have a folder that thick on Mancroft, but you're not going to get it all this morning because I can't do it in the time. So what I intend to do is talk about um, the church and how it is in the context of this area and a bit about the history of it and how it's come to be and then I shall do a quick whiz round there are no end of monuments in here as you can see I have information I think on all of them but I've just picked out one or two that are of special interest and um, I hope eventually you'll be able to if not today, have a look round. There might be some things you want to pick up. So, um, when I take people round the city, one of the first questions they say is they've never heard of St Peter Mancroft. I'm pretty sure that all of you know, but I'm going to tell you anyway. This is very much the Norman borough. The Normans had the biggest impact on the layout of Norwich. They altered everything. They plonked their cathedral over half of the Saxon marketplace and moved the market to where it is now, and they settled very much in this area. This was the Norman borough. They were known as the Frankie de Norvik, the French in Norwich, and they founded three churches in this area, St Giles, this one, and St Stephen's. Now, St Stephen's marks the southern end of the market because it was much bigger than it is now. And the original little church here, which we think was here from 1075, so 21 years before the cathedral, there was a church on this site, and we think that it was St. Peter's in the, it's either the Gemain Croft or Magna Croft. Um, if any of you are familiar with the name Brian Ayres, who was the head of our archaeological unit for many years, I call him Saint Brian and I hang on every word he said, been to lots of his lectures and I have his books, and whatever Brian says I go for. He thinks it's Gemaincroft, which is a common area. Magna might be the large field, something like that, but we believe it's been contracted down into the word Mancroft. So <clears throat> that's, um, that's the beginnings. Now, in 1075, um, the chap who was the constable of the castle was commissioned to build a church here, and his name was Ralph Guada, and you see it spelt in about 10 different ways. Um, also, I always was led to believe that he was half Breton, then in another book it says he was a local lad but his mother was Welsh. So take your pick. Anyway, 
He was married to Emma, who was daughter of William Fitzosborne from Exning in Suffolk, and they were married by the then Archbishop of Canterbury, who was Lanfranc. And during the festivities, um, Ralph hatched a plot to overthrow the king. But Lanfranc heard about this, and he snitched on him and told the king what was going on. So in the end, Guarda fled to Brittany, and Emma was left here holding siege at the castle. Now, the interesting thing is that she lasted there for three months. So we know the castle was a wooden structure to start with. So she, it was obviously a pretty substantial building for her to hold siege there. And after three months, she was allowed to join her husband in Brittany. And wouldn't you like to have been there? Whatever did she say to him? She'd been here all on her own, this valiant Emma, and when she got over there, what did she say? A lot of Anglo-Norman expletives, I would imagine. Anyway, um, Ralph left the uh, living of this, this church to his priest, Wala, who of course couldn't own anything being a priest, and so he fled to the Benedictine monastery in Gloucester. And for 300 years, this church was known as a rather snappy title of St. Peter's of Gloucester in Norwich. So for 300 years, this was run by Gloucester. However, in 1388, there was a lot of local pressure and eventually this church was handed over to St. Mary's in the field, which is was what is on the site of Chapelfield. Um, it was a large church. There is absolutely nothing left of it above ground. There are some things underneath where this group of uh, priests lived in a collegiate way. They were not belonging to any particular order. Um, and it just shows how important this building was because we are before the final charter that the city was given in 1404, which had allowed us to elect a mayor and two sheriffs to govern the city. And this is before that, this is 1388, and the city at the time was run by burgesses and they were elected in the Great Hall of St. Mary's. And if you are familiar with the layout of the Assembly House, the large room that we think of as the music room, um, underneath what you see now, there is the original brick. So that was the hall, which was the main building in this collegiate place where the burgesses were elected. So very important in the city. And there was then the decision to rebuild this little church that had been here was in a very sorry state. <coughs> we obviously don't know what it was like, but an example might be, if you're familiar with it, it's well worth going to see because it is so lovely, is the church at Hales, which is a little Norman church, and it is absolutely beautiful. And because it's a little Norman church, it might be what the original St. Peter Mancroft was like. We don't know. Um, anyway, they decided to rebuild this. St. Mary's was actually dissolved in 1544, and the dean there, Dean Spencer, um, was a very influential man in the city. He's buried in the cathedral. Um, he died in 1569, and he was aged 91. But one of the uh, things that he had to do during the dissolution was to completely destroy the church and that is what he did and there was a heap of rubble which appears on one of the old maps in the corner this heap of rubble it was there 12 years after his death and 35 years after the dissolution so we think things happened very quickly but of course they didn't um, and as I said, it appears on the Cunningham map of 1558. If you look carefully, you can pick out, it's always easy to pick out where St. Mary's was because their land actually extended right down over Chapel Field Gardens, that is their land, right down to the roundabout. Um, <clears throat> so you can pick out this little heap in the corner quite easily. Right, so, um, when I first trained here, they used to think that this church was literally built over the other one. 
But now ideas have changed. It is very complex. Um, I read it all through the other night, and I'm still not a lot clearer. Um, there is one small piece of wall in the crypt on the north side here, which might be of the older church, but we're not sure. But this church is now the second largest parish church in the country. The first largest is St Nicholas in Yarmouth. Um, I actually stopped saying this to visitors in the end because they would invariably draw themselves up and say, oh, our parish church is supposed to be the largest in the country. So I stopped saying it. Um, to be diplomatic, I think it depends how you measure it. So we'll leave it at that. Um, there's evidence that the tower that is here now was originally supposed to be freestanding. It's the way the buttresses are placed. And also, when you walk back up the church, if you just have a look, you'll see that the last arch is very squeezed together. We think they en ended up by adding it onto the church, although this wasn't the original idea. Uh, we have these lovely 17 clerestory or clear story windows at the top, which is quite large for a parish church. And um, on the tower itself, there are many niche, and people ask me if they have ever been filled. I expect they were meant to be filled with saints and what have you, but there is no evidence that they ever were. Um, <clears throat> workmen who have done work on the tower have found that the bases of these niches are very flat and it doesn't look as though anything's actually been taken out. So it's the old story of the money runs out and they couldn't finish off the decoration. Um, the pretty wooden flesh that you see on the top, the little spire um, on the tower and the what we call the pepper pots round them were not added until 1895 and if you see any early pictures of Mancroft, the view across the market, um, it's got a very flat top to the tower which nowadays looks very strange. I think the flesh has finished it off beautifully, I love it. Um, I think the thing that strikes you when you come in here is that the light inside is equivalent to the light out. And so on a sunny day, this is full of sun, it's not too bad today. And even in the winter, it's never particularly gloomy. And of course, as you look down the walls, you see that there is more glass than stone. And this is really what they were aiming to get, um, to get this to be this wonderful, airy, light building. And this is true perpendicular style, when everything soars upwards. These very delicate little columns down the nave. Um, if you can think of the huge Norman columns in the cathedral and compare several hundred years on as to what we have now. I've got a lovely picture in the cathedral of a group of school children holding hands round one of the uh, big Norman piers. You'd only need about three here, wouldn't you? They're much... Um, more slender. There is very little um, actual decoration in here. Um, there's one thing which you might be able to find. Um, I find it quite difficult. Um, on the end columns, if you look up, there is a, you can't see it from here, you'll have to go and do it later. There is a very tiny Tudor rose, and that is about the only internal decoration in here <coughs> and this might come might we say from about 1487 when Henry VII who of course had won the crown at the Battle of Bosworth two years earlier and he galloped round the country he got a very tenuous claim on the throne but he galloped round the country to try and get support and he certainly came to Norwich <clears throat> we think he probably stayed over at St Mary's in the field and it's a little bit half-hearted really but they might have put the Tudor rose up there to say well he's here so let's just put something that's just a suggestion we don't know it took me a long while to find these roses. There's one either side. Um, the church itself is, as most of our churches are in the city, built of a mixture of flint and freestone. Our only indigenous building material here is flint, as you probably know. 
And most of the free stone that you see, the white stone that's mixed in with it, you can make a pretty good guess around the city that it comes from Barnack. Um, there's this, what we call the Northamptonshire, Lincolnshire Ridge, just north of our area, <coughs> where you get Barnack, Ancaster, Clipsham and Ketton. Clipsham and Ketton are both in the city hall. We still have to import stone, of course. And like I say, most churches are Barnack. There's quite a bit of Barnack in the cathedral. Um, but I just happen to know, and I can't tell you if there's any difference, this church, the freestone, is Ancaster. So there we are. Um, to look at the interior, it's, I just think it's stunning. The roof goes right along. We don't have a, sh a shortened chancel end here. And um, the wonderful Barbara Miller, who I'm sure some of you will have heard of, she was my mentor. She's the one who got me um, guiding. I've known her since I was about 13 or 14, which is hundreds of years ago now. She says, we have this big long roof here because we're used to putting up big barns in this area. So we can just slam this up. And this is classed as the Norfolk style, but a lot of our churches, of course, do have a lowered chancel end. But the chancel is marked off here um, by the end of these gold things up on the roof. Now, these are the sun in splendour, and it is the badge of Edward IV. Um, this church really was being built in the very troubled times round about the Wars of the Roses. And um, before the Battle of Mortimer's Cross in April 1461, Edward saw the night uh, early in the morning a thing called a parhelion. And I've had this described to me by a BBC weatherman, so I know it's right. And it's to do with the atmosphere and the moisture in the air and the sun and you see three suns together i've seen pictures of these some are much more dramatic than those of course they still occur and this is what edward the fourth saw the morning of the battle of mortimer's cross and he thought this was a good omen and so he took that on as one of his emblems and that's why we have these up here as you look along, you can see this wonderful row of angels, and of course it is doubled up at the chancel end. And when you look at the shape of the roof on the east wall, you can see that this is actually a hammer beam roof. But the hammers have been covered in by this lovely, delicate wooden fan vaulting. It's quite unusual, there are three churches like this in the area. One is at Ringland and the other one is down at Framlingham in Suffolk. I've been to see the others, but of course this is the best. I mean, you'd guess it would be, wouldn't you? Um, and we've got these lovely angels, as I said, doubled up at the other end. Now, in the 1960s, they discovered that the walls were gradually falling outwards. And so the whole of the church was full of scaffolding and they literally lifted up the roof and the walls almost pinged back into shape. And they put big ties, which you can't see from here, and strengthened it all, the wall plates, and then put the roof back on. When you look, you can see that there are some replacement um, pieces of wood up here because it's a good job they did what they did because they found that some of them were really badly damaged and they were hollowed out from the other side with decay. So it was all tidied up and strengthened. And um, it is one of the glories of this church, it really is. Um, you can see a funny blue thing on this end sun. And this is where the um, curtain would have hung to cover the rude screen, which would have been across here. You can see either side these little arches here, and there would have been a, a rude crossing here, and of course at length they would be covered up. And that blue thing is like a double pulley, and they could hoist this up and then let it down. And um, so it's still left up there. Perhaps Chris is going to get it down sometime. Yeah? No? Okay. 
Right. Um, let's have a look at the east window. <coughs> None of, the, none of the glass in that window was ever in there. All the glass in this church belongs to this church, but we don't believe that any of it in there was in that window. During the Civil War, 1648, there's this famous thing in Norwich called the Great Blow with an E on the end. Um, it's quite a complex story, but of course, the main thing was that people were bored stiff. The Puritans had cancelled Christmas and anything that you had to enjoy yourself with. There was trouble with changing the mayor that people didn't agree with. And in the end, apprentices and then a huge mob gathered, started off in Chapelfield Gardens. They came through to this area and behind where the forum is now was a building called the committee house and they thought they'd have a look in there and see what there was so they went down in the cellar and lo and behold it was barrels of gunpowder um, the story is that it was brought up by the hatful but somehow there must have been a lantern or something and the whole lot went up and there was this enormous explosion. And the word explosion had not been invented, which is why it's called the Great Blow. And just to give you some idea how big it was, um, I've got these somewhere. There was 36 barrels of gunpowder, I think, that, went, that were going to be ignited under the Houses of Parliament in 1605 and in the committee house there was 96 so an enormous explosion what it did was it sucked out the glass from all the windows at the east end and also at St Stephen's church as well and for four years the glass lay in a heap on the floor and there was a sacking cover over the window and then after four years, they decided that they would start to put it together again. But of course, things were missing and they had to just use what there was. Consequently, some of it is not um, complete. Now, further up, it is very fragmentary. But lower down, there are some more complete ones. But one of the things that, that did happen was, if you look on the far south corner here, you can see the bottom window has there's a lot of blue there. Yeah, we believe this is the Tops family. Robert Tops is the chap associated with Dragon Hall. He's certainly buried in here, and he certainly gave money to the church. And that is him and his family. But when you look closely, one of the daughters has gained an angel's head because hers is missing. And somebody told me many years ago that somewhere on there, somebody has got an animal's leg instead of an arm. And I have sat for hours trying to find it, and I couldn't, so I think they were having me on. Um, if you go three windows in, the third panel, sorry, two panels in, three down, um, you can see what looks like a great big white blob. And we think that this window was probably in another window and much lower down and that as people used to do, they would touch it as a kind of special thing. And so it's got completely worn away. But of course it's now so much higher up. And there are some delightful things in this window. The centre panel and the two either side on the bottom level are Victorian additions, but the rest actually does come from this church. I've been to two lectures about this glass. Um, I got totally confused because they tend to know where things were situated in a church. Um, but it's a wonderful window. 
and um, during World War I it was covered up and during World War II it was actually removed. I'm not sure where it went and then put back. But the Dennis King um, family, who have done such a lot with our um, local churches, um, I think that it was part of their family that put in the reconstruction. But like I said, the, the top few are very fragmentary when you look at it. So, underneath this wonderful window, um, we have this Reredos, which dates from 1885. I have actually seen what's behind it, and it's obviously some stonework which was, we assume, scraped off during the Civil War. And um, this is by a chap called J.P. Seddon. And then in the 1930s, Ninian Comper did the gilding on here, and you'll also see his work at Wyndham Abbey. You either love it or hate it. Um, it's very sort of Victorian Gothic, um, this blue and gold that he was so keen on. And he added the saints along the bottom, which flank the central figure of Christ. It's a beardless Christ, which is quite unusual. And the four saints along the bottom are Augustine, Columba, Felix, and St. Alban, who are all associated with bringing Christianity to this area. The end one here on the south side, you can see he's holding something, and it's a big palm leaf, and this is the emblem of St. Alban. So he's the end one there. And then on the, north side, on the south side here, up here, you can see the memorial to Sir Thomas Brown. And here's the chap who's sitting in the Haymarket. Um, the statue is a Pegram, Pegram statue, 1905. And if Sir Thomas lifted his head, he could look across to where his house was. Um, he wasn't actually born in Norwich, but he came here in 1637. He was born in 1605. And basically, he was a family physician. In the um, treasury there, you'll see some things connected with his work. But he was also a botanist, a zoologist, a writer, and a researcher. He was a true Renaissance man. He was knighted in 1671 in what we now think of as St. Andrew's Hall. Um, Charles II had actually come to knight the mayor. And the mayor said, no, 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 it mustn't be me, it must be... Thomas Brown. So he actually stepped down and Charles II knighted Thomas Brown. And after the Civil War, he did a very comprehensive inventory of what was left in the cathedral because um, I think it's very difficult to imagine what the cathedral interior looked like before the Civil War. We know there were several railed tombs all around and the destruction there um, I don't think we can even comprehend. And Thomas Brown did this inventory of what was left, and of course it was an extremely useful thing to have. Um, he wrote several books, a Religio Medici, Christian Morals, Quincunx, and Urn Burial. And um, when you look at his statue, he's actually holding a shard of pottery, and this is all to do with his urn burial thing. Now, the quincunx, um, he was fascinated with this, and it's what you do if you draw a diamond and then put one in the middle, a dot in the middle, and you join all these up to make a pattern, and whichever way you look at it, it's all straight lines. And he somehow was fascinated with this, and he wrote a book about it. Heaven knows how long the book is, but, you know, that's what a quincunx is. Um, when the sanctuary level was altered here, um, the workman, um, unfortunately, cracked into his coffin. And um, it was opened, and Robert Fitch, who was a local historian, who was very keen on phrenology and skulls and things like that, took the skull out to examine it, and it ended up at the Norfolk and Norwich, and it didn't get back here um, until 1922. <laughs> so it has now been reunited, you'll be pleased to hear. And of course, on the other side, the memorial up there is to his wife, Dorothy. <coughs> right, um, 
I'm going to sort of start going round the cathedral, a uh, uh, cathedral, the church. I'm going to go anti-clockwise. I don't quite know why. I think it was just the way I sort of sorted it out. And um, behind the exhibition here, the large tomb. You just see a gentleman depicted there, and this is Francis Wyndham. He was born at Felbrigg. He was the second of three sons, and he married Elizabeth Bacon, who was the daughter of Sir Nicholas Bacon, Lord Keeper of Elizabeth I's stepsister. Um, he had no children, and when you look at his depiction there, he's wearing a little cap, which is called a coif, and he's wearing it. It's very important because he was allowed to wear it, or any one of his position, in front of royalty because it just shows that the law is above royalty so he didn't have to remove this if he was in the presence of the queen or king or whatever he was um he was the judge of the court of common pleas and he drew up the prosecution papers for the trial of mary tudor he represented the city in parliament and he lived in bethel street up the back here which was from the Norman times, Upper Newport Street, St Giles's Lower Newport Street. And um, his house was the one that became the committee house, which was then blown up in 1648. So there's Thomas Wyndham. Um, as I said, we've got this, the rude loft that went along here. All we have left of it um, are these two. You can get up a little staircase there and you were able to walk across it some, I think it's Thetford, there's a very good rood loft you can see, and you can obviously see how you can walk across. And um, it would have had three statues on it, the um, Virgin Mary, a cross in the middle, and St John the Evangelist. Um, the treasury, of course, is in this, um, we've got tiny little sort of transepts in this church. They're not large like many churches, um, almost these little cubby holes. And this treasury dates from 1982 and was um, the brainchild of Paul Raymond King, who does an awful lot in the city. He still does. You'll see him beetling about. Um, and it's done in memory of his parents. Um, I'm not going to go over what's in there, but there are some wonderful things in there. But if you do have a look, you'll see an enormous earthenware jug. And this is the ringer's jug. And next to it, I'm just checking that it's there, is a um, watercolour by um, Henry Ninham. And it's called Christmas Eve. And the ringer's jug is in the painting. And the painting is a picture of the ringing chamber up behind us there. And the jug stands in the middle. It holds 33 pints of beer. And the idea was that if they'd done their ringing practice, then they could have a drink. So there's the ringing jug, it's still there. And um, I was horrified when I was sitting up the back one day and um, one of our guides came in, this is many years ago, and she stood and told the people it was made of leather. And it's quite obviously <laughs> earthenware. So I thought, well, perhaps you'd need to go and look at it. There we are. Now, um, the lovely window in there it's called the Four Sisters window, and the glass dates from 1911, and it was um, put there by Thomas Gillett, and it's called Four Sisters because it's in memory of his four sisters. Um, I've got an awful lot of information about some of these things, but I'm not going to go into um, too much detail here. And then we've got this lovely painting here, which is called Wist Ye Not, and it's by Harry Milam, and dates from about 1905. And it is Christ um, in the temple talking to the elders. And um, Harry Milam exhibited at the Royal Academy. Further along the wall, you will see that we have um, one of the monuments is actually all in Hebrew. It's the only one in the church. I'm sure this is quite an unusual thing. And it's the first two verses of Palm, Psalm 112, and it is the Johannes Mackerel Memorial. Um, 
the painting over the north door there, which is a bit dark, but when you get opposite it, it's not too bad. And it's St. Peter's Deliverance from Prison. It's a late 18th century painting by a chap called George Catton. And he was coach painter to George III. Um, it's, a, it's a lovely depiction when you can look at it more head on. Um, you can see how fine it is. Just to digress slightly, these, um, oops, these um, large monuments that you see, um, one afternoon when I was in here, um, I think it's the one over there, was somehow becoming loose. And I sat here once a week watching this stonemason. All the bits are completely separate. I just thought it was one great big thing that's stuck on the wall. And it isn't. It's all separate pieces. It's like putting together a jigsaw. And he had to take it all off and do whatever was needed to stabilise it. And then it all went back in its little sections. So these really ornate ones that you see, they really have taken um, an awful lot of effort to get these um, put up here. Anyway, that's a by the by. Um, the baptistry. Of course, the famous thing in here is the tapestry. You can see the lights on there. Um, I sometimes think it's actually better to look at it without the light on, but there you are, you must make your own minds up. And you'll see a date on there, which is 1573. Um, we think that this was done by the Dutch weavers, these strangers who were allowed to come into the city after the edict of Queen Elizabeth I in 1565, 24 Flemish-speaking Dutch families and six French-speaking Walloons. And, um, of course, it opened the floodgates, and by the end of the 16th century, one in three of the population of Norwich was a foreigner or what was known as a stranger. And, of course, we had an awful lot of Dutch influence in the city. Many people can trace the origin of their surname back to one of these groups. They invigorated our weaving industry. They were mainly well accepted. Of course, there were some problems. Um, and, of course, some words have entered, some Dutch words have entered the Norfolk dialect. Um, it's famous, really, well, famous in the city, I suppose, um, when you look at what's depicted on there, because on the south side you will see um, the depiction of Mary Magdalene who meets Christ in <coughs> the garden after, the, after he's risen. And she thinks he's a gardener. And they have done this very typically. They put him in a floppy gardening hat and he's carrying a spade. And you don't often see Christ A in a hat. Apparently there's a picture in the Uffizi of Christ in a hat. And you don't often see him with a spade, do you? And when you see the tomb with Christ risen, there is like an enormous halo all the way round him, not just round his head. And this is called a mandala. Um, <clears throat> I think the thing I was going to do down this end also was in um, the chapel here, the window here. The theme here is all mountains because um, it's actually... It's actually done in memory of one of the um, incumbents here who died not of climbing, but I think he had a heart attack when he was out climbing um, in the Alps. So the theme there is all, man all mountains. His name is Pelham Byrne. And um, below it, you can see the altar with this lovely modern altar frontal. And this is done by Elizabeth Clover. And I remember one afternoon, um, one of her students came in here to see some of her work. She also did the one in St Anne's Chapel, and she was fascinated with the tapestry as well. It was interesting to compare um, sort of textile work from the 16th century to the 20th century. She was the most interesting lady. So, um, the other thing we've got in the baptistry, which you can't really avoid, can you, which is the font. Um, the font that you see was given to the church in 1463 by a, <coughs> a grocer called um, 
uh, by William Corston. And um, it's actually a seven sacrament font. Uh, we have a seven sacrament font in the cathedral, which is sculpted. There are 40 of these left in the country and 38 are in Norfolk and Suffolk. That one was painted, so round the um, eight-sided bowl were the seven sacraments painted and the eighth side, once again, was the sun in splendour. But the damage done there was done during the Civil War. You can see how things have been gouged out of it. There's probably saints around the stem. And it was thrown outside and another one was made and put here. But in the 1920s, they decided that, well, this was the one for the church. And it had been chucked outside, so they reinstated it, levelled it up, and gave the more modern one to another church in the city. So that is the original font that was given to the church. A lot of people used to come in and say, oh, I was, I was actually baptised in here, and that was lovely to hear. The cover over it, you don't need all this. All you need is a lockable cover so that people don't steal the holy water. So this is really OTT, and it goes up to the first level, which is consistent with the age of the font, and all that top bit was added in 1888 to commemorate, 1887 to commemorate Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee. So it's, you don't need it all, but there we are, and it's one of the biggest, I think, that there are. It's a massive thing. Right, uh, next to it, of course, is the, um, in the case, is um, the Articles of the Bell Ringer's Purse, which dates from 1716. And, of course, we're round now towards the organ and the bell ringing chamber. Um, this organ, um, it's very complicated. We've had about three organs in this church. Uh, this one dates um, from... <coughs> this dates from the... Um, 1984, um, the money was raised by public subscription and it was all the brainchild of Kenneth Ryder, who was an organist here for 42 years. There's a plaque to him at the back. I knew Kenneth. Um, he was a very nice man and it has 2,600 pipes, which is nothing compared with the cathedral, which is 6,655, but there we are. And it cost £120. It's very, very loud. Um, obviously, we have organ scholars connected with the university, and you don't have your own organ to practice on, so they're either at the cathedral or they come here, and just before their exams, it really is a bit much. I don't know if they still do this. I had one lady come in, this organ student was banging away, rehearsing all his whatever bits and she said all I've done is come in here for a few quiet minutes and there's no way you can get but there we are it's a working building we have to do our own bit and it's very cleverly added because there's only two holes made in the stonework it's cantilevered out on a big H frame and of course behind it um, we have the ringing chamber um, and this is the first place in the world that a true peal was rung in 1715. Um, I've had this explained to me two or three times by bell ringers. I still don't understand it. It takes about two to three hours. I still want to know what happens if somebody goes wrong. Do you have to go back to the beginning? Anyway, um, before, we had the, before the true peal was rung, the bells of Mancroft are very famous. Apparently they were rung for the triumphing of um, our overcoming of the Spaniards at the time of the Armada, 1588. And um, <clears throat> I think um, to go up in that little ringing chamber is, is actually quite lovely. There's a lot of Georgian things there. They've got the boards of the ringers that used to be there. There's three churches that you ring bells in the city. There's this one, I think it's St. Giles and St. Andrews, and they're depicted on the ringers purse at the back there. <coughs> right, um, 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 um. I said we've had several organs here. The Helle organ was here. The pipes of that filled the south transept here. 
in the late 1980s, and, it, and originally um, it was at the West End where the Renatus Harris August, or, organ uh, stood from 1707 to 1866. Um, organs have been moved around in here, but in the end this one was given to St Nicholas in Yarmouth and was destroyed in World War II, which is a bit of a shame. But part of the gallery and the Queen Anne woodwork is just round here, and it covers the electrics for this little organ here. Um, interestingly, in the, um, if you look at the depiction above the organ there, you'll see that there's a very distinct piece added in the middle, a round bit, with a cherub's head in it. And um, this is the daughter of the vicar at the time. He was Canon Mayrick. And, um, his uh, son-in-law, son brother-in-law rather, painted that because it used to have a clock in it. And when it stood at the far end, the vicar could have some idea about how long he was talking for um, during his sermon. But when they moved it up here, they thought, well, this isn't very good because it's now the um, congregation who can see how long he's talking. And so they took the clock out, and that's why we have um, this nice little cherub in the middle. Right, we're coming down this wall now. <clears throat> Many of the memorials here are to the Patterson family. Um, they're a very prominent family in the city. Um, I won't go through them all because uh, I think we're going to get a bit run out of time. Um, but John Patterson, who's one of the later ones, was um, a wool stapler. Um, and he's the chap who did the Grand Tour when everybody was doing this in the 18th century, going abroad and bringing back all sorts of things perhaps they shouldn't. And um, his son then spent the rest of his life trying to pay off his father's debts. But John Patterson could see what was happening to our woolen trade. Uh, many merchants could see what was happening when it was all dying off at the Industrial Revolution. And there wasn't a lot they could do about it. And there's some very sad stories. Many of our merchants went spectacularly bankrupt. But um, John Patterson actually invested some money in a little local brewery. And eventually this became Stuart and Patterson's, which is one of our big five. So although he spent an awful lot of money, um, he did do that and set up one of our famous breweries here. Um, also, the little stone um, plaque there is to the um, Far East Prisoners of War. And um, I'm particularly fond of this one. My father was a Japanese prisoner of war. He um, <coughs> worked on the railway and all the rest of it. And um, they actually held services here for these people, I think as late as about 1987, which is very nice. Okay, so we're down to St Anne's Chapel here. Uh, we've done a bit about the, um, a bit about the cherub. Um, the painting there is Moses on Pisgah by Sir William Richmond, who's this chap, who was the father-in-law of Canon Mayrick, who painted the cherub. Sorry, I got that the wrong way round. Um, the east window in this little chapel. Um, it's by H. Hendry. It's in the style of Eric Gill, and it's a memorial to the dead in World War I. And once again, the altar frontal is done by um, Isabel Clover. And on the side, you will find um, a monument to Augustine Brigg. I'm sure you're aware of Brigg Street. Um, it joins sort of Rampant Hall Street coming towards the market. Um, he was a grocer. He was mayor in 1670, and his son of the same name was mayor in 1695. So, um, we've sort of come full circle round here. There are an awful lot more things I could tell you, but um, we've been getting on for an hour, and I'm sure that you've had enough. But um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, it's been really nice to be able to um, tell what I hope are local people a bit about one of our magnificent things in the city. So 
Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Well, I don't know about you, but I've only been here just over two years, um, having come from the cathedral as a, now as the head of events and also as head verger. And I learnt loads, and I've been writing lots of notes down because just in case I get asked questions, which of course you do when you're about your business in, in such a beautiful building and with visitors coming in. And while you were chatting away, um, Michael, our comms guy, um, went and got something for me. It's in a box. Not Yorick. <laughs> this is the plaster cast that they made of Sir Thomas Brown's head. When, as we've heard earlier, that it was the Victorians went into the, um, the crypt at the very east end and for some reason removed his skull. And then it went over to the Norfolk and Norwich Hospital in the old NNN, where it used to be, and they took a plaster cast of it. Then in the 1920s, um, they, they decided to have a clear out of their cupboards at the Norfolk and Norwich, and they said, well, would we like the plaster cast and could we have the head back? Um, and obviously they said yes, so here's the plaster cast, which sometimes sits in the centre case over in our own treasury, um, where there's currently a silver spoon exhibition. Um, so that sits over there, and then you ask yourselves, well, what do they do with this head? Well, of course, they couldn't go into the vault anymore at that point. So what they've done is, if you go up the steps very carefully, health and safety note, um, you can see there's a small um, plaque on the floor there, and they buried his head as, as near as they could to where his, uh, the rest of him was, but underneath his memorial. So I just thought you might like to see him and, and say hello. So on, we've had a... I used to sit in the cupboard in my office and it was rather off-putting. Um, so, so on your behalf, can I thank uh, Jan this morning for taking us on a, a lovely walking tour, which we've enjoyed sitting down in uh, this wonderful building, um, St. Peter Mancroft, which of course is that civic church. And we've heard so much about how they, we knit together within our community of the city of Norwich. So Jan, thank you very, very much and may we show our appreciation in the normal way. Thank you, Jan. <laughs> Jan was speaking of the bells. Now, yesterday we had a bells talk, so if you go online, you'll find a, a really interesting talk about the history of Norwich Cathedral, uh, Norwich Cathedral, St. Peter <laughs> Mancroft bells, I'm as bad as you are, and uh, if you, want to find out more tomorrow about the Treasury, we're going to have a talk at 11.30 by Dr Mary Fuster, and it's entitled The Table Set Before Us. Now, Mary is a specialist um, in silver, and she'll be uh, giving us a talk about what the sort of things we would have had on our dining tables from the medieval period through to, to modern day. Some examples you'll find in the treasury because some domestic silver was used in churches um, and other bits um, I've dug out from a cupboard and Mary were bringing some things on. We'll have a table set before you and you'll be able to see some of these items in the flesh. So that's on Thursday and on Friday we've got Dr Tim Pestle who's the senior curator at uh, Norfolk Museum Services and up at the Castle Museum and he'll be talking about the history of Norwich and Norfolk and also nationally about the archaeology that's been found in our way. And Saturday um, we have a talk about playing of the merry organ, sweet singing in the choir which our comms guy, Michael, is going to be giving us. And you'll hear even more about the history of music making at St. Peter Mancroft, and also, of course, the various roaming St. Peter Mancroft organ. So, um, yeah, that's another one worth watching. So thank you very much for being here. Um, just in case, you'll find at the back, if you wanted to find out some more about our history, we have just had, modelled by Michael on my left, um, 
There we go. A brand new guidebook for the church. Um, and it is really, it's got some beautiful pictures in it, as well as some history as well. So it's well worth getting at the back of the church. So that's the end of the adverts. Thank you.